welcome everyone. Feel free to turn on your videos and if you should be able to unmute yourselves, if you have any problems, let me know. Okay, great. I see videos, fantastic. Okay. I'm just gonna pull up so we have some cases to go through. Let me try this again. There we go. Okay, so we have about four cases and we'll say, we'll round down and say like 30 minutes and leave some extra time for questions. Um, so we'll try and go through relatively quickly. And I will take, I'm not gonna call on people, I'll take any, any volunteers. And please, uh, please tell me how to say your name properly if you do answer a question. Okay, so let's dive into it. So our first case is gonna be a gentleman with COPD, so gold C, gold D, pardon me, COPD, and some home oxygen coming in with cough, wheezing, kind of sounds like a COPD exacerbation. He's been intubated twice before for COPD exacerbations. You can see his vitals there. I'll give you a minute to take a look at that. We're not showing you his chest radiograph, but basically he just looks hyperinflated. Maybe some thickened airways, but no focal opacities. He has a blood gas. So someone had asked a question about blood gases. Here we go. But anyone want to take a stab at this ABG? It's hypercapnic and hypoxemic respiratory failure. Yeah, great. And what do you think about that hypercapnia? Acute, chronic, some of both? I mean, there's no bicarb. I'm assuming it's like acute on chronic. I would yeah, think that if it was uh, more just acute, his pH would be lower. Exactly, yeah. Um, so just like you pointed out, um, there's a couple of different calculations people will use. I usually use the rule of thumb for every change in 10 points of um, PCO2. The pH for an acute um, acidosis should change by 0.08. Um, and it's about 0.03 for chronic. Um, and so just looking at that CO2 of 74, if that was all acute, that pH should be much, much lower. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Okay. All right, so you're gonna give them all the good stuff for the COPD exacerbation, bronchodilators, prednisone. Do you wanna do anything else for them or just leave them on the four liters? For ventilation. BiPAP? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's decompensating on that four liter, so he's not going to, I mean, at some point he's going to continue to decompensate, you know, get ahead of the curve. He's going to be, he should get on BiPAP. Yeah, I think mean, that's unreasonable. He's always pr already pretty tachypnic, uh, the nasal cannula. Okay. What kind of settings do you want to start them on? I mean, I think it probably depends on how he looks, but I don't know, 12 over 5, so he does with that. I mean, it's going to depend on what his prior settings have been and everything else, you know, what his intrinsic peep is, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think we don't know anything about kind of prior settings at this point. He wasn't um, intubated at our hospital before. I think that sounds good. Why don't anyone start with different numbers than 12 over 5? A minimum fine with 10 over 5. A peep of 5 is actually, I mean, a minimum that mm -hmm. one can start with and then do a VBZ right after, like an hour later to see mm -hmm. what the response is and then you can change it accordingly. Okay, I like that approach. Yeah. All right. So what are you shooting for with, um, with the BiPAP? So when you got 
that follow up VBG? You're looking for perfection, pH is 7.4. What are you looking for? I think anything above 7.35, uh, between 7.35 and 7.45 is uh, acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you overshoot, then uh, he might go into respiratory alkalosis. So you have to just be in the range. I think I probably care less about his pH and more about his PCO2. You know, try and get that. Um, I'm just thinking of, for me, I guess anything above 7.25 at least in the initial, you know, so looking to avoid intubation. Um, but I'd love to get that, uh, you know, if we figure out how much of it, or whatever this is, is chronic, it's probably running at 7.32. So it probably runs with a PCO2 of around 60. So just trying to drive that down um, and just seeing how he does. And also worker breathing and just how he looks. Sure. Okay. All right, so um, for acute treatment of COPD exacerbation, there's definitely a very good role for non-invasive ventilation in the literature. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more going forward. But it, exactly what settings haven't so much been fleshed out. So with, uh, with non-invasive, with most machines that you're gonna have in the hospital, you can either put them in a spontaneous or an ST, which is a spontaneous slash timed mode, meaning you put in a backup rate. Um, and as we talked about a little bit in the intro, and as I'm sure you're familiar with, you're setting kind of the IPAP, the EPAP, and then whatever FI2 you want to meet your goal. And so I think that, you know, you all kind of latched onto settings that I think are pretty much where we start. Usually for adults, we're not starting with a PEEP less than five, maybe four, if it's a really small person. Um, so I think, you know, an EPAP of five is a good place to start um, with a patient like this. And then an IPAP somewhere in that roughly 10 range. Okay. I will say for uh, chronically, there are some studies in COPD that have shown benefit in kind of preventing readmissions or preventing exacerbations from really extreme BiPAP settings. But we're not talking about that in this context. This is just like how to keep the guy from getting intubated. Um, and so and we talked about this a little bit, but you're going to get scalars like this on the non-invasive, just like you would on an invasive mechanical ventilator. Um, and this is really pretty comparable to what you would see in kind of pressure support on the mechanical ventilator, but there's one difference. So when we're comparing like pressure support on the vent to BiPAP, other than the lack of an endotracheal tube. There's something about these pressures that's actually different. There's only a driving pressure of five rather than a driving pressure of 10 over a peak of five. Yeah, exactly right. So on, on BiPAP, we actually set so that the IPAP is 10 and the pressure support is five. So this would be equivalent to pressure support of five over five on the ventilator where the pressure support is above the peep. Um, with non-invasive, we just, it's the absolute pressures. Does that make sense to everyone? Heard that before. Okay. I don't know why that convention exists, by the way. I think it's to confuse interns, but this is what it is. Okay, we talked about this. Um, okay, so how is the IDE ratio going to be set for this patient? He's already kind of tachypneic, right, which is not ideal in someone with obstructive lung disease. How are we going to affect the IDE ratio on BiPAP? Usually for a COPD, uh, uh, the IT, the e, I mean, the expiration time should be a little more than normal people just because they are already obstructed. So we have to give them more time for expiration. Mm -hmm. uh, I to E ratio for normal people is one is to two. For COPD years, we can go up to one is to three. 1.25, one, one, one is to 2.5 or one is to three. Yeah, so I agree he's likely to have kind of a prolonged expiratory phase, but how can we control that on the, on the non-invasive ventilator? You can't, uh, you know, we're gonna be able to, you can just decrease the eye time. Mm 
You can't do much about the E time, but you can just decrease the I time. Yeah, and so on a um, sort of on pressure control on an invasive mechanical ventilator, you have a lot of I time you can move, and, and there's still um, still some things you can do on the bi level, um, but you can't do as much, right? So you're kind of stuck with what um, the biggest determinant, I guess the taking point is the biggest determinant here is going to be the patient's own respiratory rate. And there's a few things you can do to try and get that breath in faster. You can adjust the rise time, for instance, but the biggest driver here is going to be how fast the patient is breathing. Um, and this is what I think some of you were, were getting at. And I think Liz, you had mentioned earlier is what about the patient's own like intrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP. Um, and so this is why we don't like fast respiratory rates in patients with obstructive lung disease, because we worry um, just as several of you have mentioned that given sort of the prolonged time patients need for exhalation, that if their next breath comes before they're done breathing out, they may wind up kind of breath stacking and winding up with um, what we call dynamic hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. So has anyone seen a chart like this before? Not In real life? No. no. Yeah, okay. Questions, yeah. Yeah, fair enough, um, fair enough. Yeah, so this is, um, this is what we're worried about here, right? And so, and you can see this when you look at a flow tracing on any ventilator, right? So this is great to be able to go to the bedside and take a look. Where do you want this dark blue flow tracing to be before the next breath? Zero. Yeah, you want it to come all the way back up to zero. Right? And if that's not happening, then the machine's gonna de deliver another breath um, before the patient's completely um, completely exhaled. And that's going to lead to air trapping. And eventually that's going to manifest as auto peep. Ideally, we would catch this kind of before it leads to a lot of auto peep. So on an invasive mechanical ventilator, you can do an auto peep maneuver. Um, what are things you can do to sort of decrease somebody's respiratory rate when they're on BiPAP? They can always target you know, some psychological aspects. You got benzos and opiates, you know, just decreasing. You could obviously be careful, but sometimes if they're put on the full face mask and that's just exacerbating everything. So decreasing their anxiety can make a big difference. Yeah, so I think that's a great thought. Obviously being careful with anything centrally acting, but um, sometimes if you can manage you know, kind of address any anxiety component and bring the respiratory rate that down, um, you can you can buy people some time and allow this process to reverse. If they're pulling a little bit uh, larger lung volumes, will that help with their tachypnea as well? Uh, say that again? If um, they're getting slightly more pressure support and getting some more higher lung volumes, will that help with their tachypnea as well? Yes, so that's another thing you can do, right? And so if people are still feeling air hungry, they might breathe faster. If you can increase their, that IPAP, the inspiratory pressure, to give them a bigger breath, exactly, you may ameliorate that. So this patient, so I didn't quite take your settings, started at 10 over four, um, the rise time of three, and you wind up using a full face mask, and we'll imagine this is our patient here. And you foresee any problems with, with our choice of mask. Now yeah, we need to get to Italy where we can have the uh, helmets. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so, so someone who hasn't spoken up before, what's kind of what problem are we getting at with the mask in this patient? So with the beard that he has, it might leak in that area. Yeah, the beard. We're worried about a leak. Absolutely. Yeah. And so thinking about, now we don't know, maybe we'll still be able to get a good seal, but I am worried like you that we won't. Um, there's a couple of things that will suggest um, 
success in patients on non-invasive ventilation. So um, one is actually kind of an improvement in, uh, in the pH. Yeah. And then the other is kind of seeing that quick change in work of breathing uh, by reduced respiratory rate. And you should see this soon, right? And so the non-invasive is not something you kind of set on and then you come back in like six hours to see if the patient is any better. Um, and the way I think about this, again, is this is, in, this is mechanical ventilation. You just don't have a secure airway, right? So it's actually a relatively risky thing to do to someone in the acute setting. Now, there is some data for it, which we'll talk about, but it's definitely not something you can put on all your patients and just walk away. Um, and so we know for COPD specifically, this is when non-invasive is compared to just kind of standard or low flow oxygen. So that's that first group of devices Matt talked about. Um, it's associated with mortality benefit, fewer intubations, and shorter both ICU and hospital length of stay. Okay. But this is for COPD. What about kind of non-invasive in other settings? Where else have you seen non-invasive used? Heart failure. Heart yeah. failure. Great. Mm -hmm. What about uh, failure of extubation? Post extubation. Yes, yeah, so we can use it in post, post extubation, but the data aren't so good there. Okay. So in post extubation of respiratory failure, kind of with the exception of a recent trial that it was in abdominal surgery patients, it's generally not recommended because it just delays the time to reintubation. But I'd say for COPD in a patient like this, great data. Okay. So let's move on. We'll finish up this case and then we'll do the other ones quickly. Um, so you come back to check on your patient just like all of you wanted to do. What do you think? Now he's working even harder. He's even more to Kipnik and his blood gas is even a little bit worse, right? I think his pH was 7 point, a little north of 7.3 before. So why else might this guy not be getting better? So you mentioned his beard before. Okay. What can you do about the beard? Oh, I'm seeing some uh, sign language for shaving. Yep, so you can shave him real fast. You can also put tegaderm on the beard, believe it or not. Um, you can put some tegaderms on either side, and that way the mask will seal against the tegaderm. Kind of a trick I learned from the nurses. Um, can you then, try a different mask? Try a different mask. Great. Yes. And then someone had also mentioned increasing pressure. Yeah. Fantastic. So maybe the settings aren't right. Maybe we're not giving him a big enough breath, and that's why he's more to Kepnik. Maybe we just need to address the beard. Okay. We talked about this. Right, so you have a, depending on where you are, right, you might have a variety of mask options or you might not have as many. Um, but it's possible that one of these other masks, either just a nasal mask or one of the masks that goes over the entire face might be better for this guy. All right, so you picked a different mask, just as you suggested, and he looks better. So congrats, you staved off intubation, he's a happy camper. All right, so I think we talked about this a little bit already. Um, maybe using some anxiolytics, but cautiously. Um, if you're gonna see a benefit, it should happen quickly. And really upfront, you're kind of using it for long periods of time. Okay, so let's go over some other cases. So got another gentleman coming in with a couple days of fever, cough. Got that radiograph and he's pretty hypoxemic. So what do you see on the chest x-ray? Normal or abnormal? It looks abnormal. Uh, uh, there, so there are increased lung markings initially. Uh, there are some signs of, I mean, yeah, there looks like there is some hyperinflation as well. Uh, yeah, great. So there's definitely way too many markings here. Kind of. Actually, bronchial markings as well, because I could see some circular, like, you know, uh, 
as if it's like more of a bronchitis kind of picture. Yeah, so I, I'm going to paraphrase slightly, but I agree. And here, I think he's probably got some thickened airways. And then over here, I must see some mm -hmm. air bronchograms, so some mm -hmm. alveolar opacities. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. All right. So we talked about this. He doesn't look so good. To Kipnik, desatting. You know, treat him for pneumonia, and then he gets put on a mask like this. Okay. And maybe his sats are holding around 90. And the RT suggests that his oxygenation will get better if you just cover up those side ports, keep the oxygen in, keep the room air out. What do you think? Yeah, it should help. Is there any downside to doing that? Exhalation, right? I mean, if you just cover it rather than a one way valve or something. Exactly. So if you just cover them, then his exhalation would be diminished, right? And that's how he's gonna clear CO2 from this mask. If you're able to get a one-way valve on where he could breathe out but not in, then you'd be talking. But for, just to cover these is not actually gonna help. Um, his ventilation will get worse. And then it's also gonna be important to make sure that depending on the mask, he's got enough oxygen to actually overcome the nice work. I think it's the masks where I came from, they had to be on eight liters. Um, otherwise, they're just going to start entraining everything. Um, they weren't going to get enough flow to actually be able to breathe in. Yeah, so that's a great point. Uh, most non-rebreather masks, you'll need to crank up kind of flush with the wall, which is usually 15 liters. Um, and even patients with really high work of breathing can actually pull enough air to completely deflate that reservoir which e with each breath. Um, but exactly, if you have a reservoir mask, which this isn't, but if you have one and the reservoir isn't full, you're really not getting the benefit. So what do you think we should do for this gentleman? I'm, I'm not so sure this is cap. I mean, I'm just looking at how diffuse it is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got, my guess is he's probably entering uh, early ARDS. Could be yeah, from yeah. cap, but I think he needs a tube. Okay, so you can intubate him. See, sorry. Anything you would do? Anyone want to try something non-invasive for him? I would start with uh, like maybe CPAP or high flow nasal cannula uh, to give him some peep and see if he responds to that. If he doesn't, then yeah, uh, sure, we can do the tube. Yeah, so I think, um, I think that's a great thought. I think high flow, if we're going to do anything, I think it's high flow for this patient. And we can talk a little bit about, about why. So we'll get to kind of a well, let me make sure the time. We talk a little bit, but so for acute respiratory failure, sort of all comers, um, generally there's gonna be a limited role for non-invasive ventilation. We're talking about positive pressure. For high flow, there's been some data in recent years that shows a lot of promise for kind of all comers, hypoxemic respiratory failure, which this patient I think would kind of fit in that bucket. Maybe as a pneumonia, maybe he is evolving into ARDS. Um, but I think high flow would be reasonable for this patient. Um, and this comes really from a trial called the Florali trial. And there's been a couple of other similar trials like this. Um, but this particular one looked at about 300 patients with acute respiratory failure, uh, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And they were randomized into groups that got high flow with pretty high settings. I think the, the average um, flow was at least 40 liters a minute. Um, standard oxygen, so kind of those low flow devices or non-invasive. And their settings there were about like eight over five, roughly. And the survival was markedly improved in the patients who got high flow. And you might say, well, maybe they didn't get super high non-invasive settings. Maybe if the settings had been different, who knows? But I think the bottom line is the high flow definitely was, um, was an improvement over the standard oxygen therapy. Um, and this has been looked at in a couple of other studies. Not every single study of high flow has been positive. But I think there's enough of a signal now that when you're using it at those high flow settings, like 30, 40 plus liters a minute, um, in some patients, it can absolutely reduce the need for intubation. So we talked about this a little bit already, Matt and I did in the beginning, but this is why the, the high, high flow is helpful. And it has to do with the anatomic dead space, right? So we all have anatomic dead space um, 
it's usually about a, between that and any physiologic dead space we have, it's about um, a third, right, of our tidal volume. And so what high flow does is it actually washes out the nasopharynx and some of the oropharynx. And so it effectively just moves fresh air like closer to the lungs. So if you're in acute respiratory failure, you're working hard to breathe. Now you work a little bit less hard because that fresh air is within reach. Does that make sense? So when these people are on like nasal pillows for BiPAP or they're on like mm -hmm. high flow, but they're just breathing through their mouth, are they still getting all that benefits? It's that air is kind of flushing everything in the nasopharynx, even though they're not technically pulling things in through their nose. Great question. So the the benefit here, so this is really specifically for high flow nasal cannula, um, not so much for for um, BiPAP or non-invasive. This is really for high flow, um, and Yes, the, the washout of the dead space still applies even if you're breathing through your mouth. Now, what doesn't, um, what does change a little bit is the PEEP question. So a couple people have asked, I'm going to go ahead a little bit and then we'll come back to this. Um, all right, never mind, that one's a little further. But the PEEP is actually pretty negligible, um, particularly with the mouth open. Anyone want to guess how much PEEP high flow gives you with the mouth closed at 60 liters? We'll say between four and five. Yeah, what other numbers have people heard? Two or three or something. Yeah, so it's pretty low, maybe about two centimeters of water. And that only applies with the mouth closed. So once you open the mouth, forget about it. Um, so the PEEP is, I was always taught, oh, that it gets a, gives you a little bit of PEEP and that's why it's helpful, but it turns out that's probably not the case. It's really more the washout of the anatomic dead space. Um, and so this is, um, there were some questions in the beginning, you know, does it matter? Is it 40 versus 60? Is it really different? And I think the answer is yes and no. Um, definitely, again, you don't want to start any lower than about 30 liters because the studies that have shown a benefit in high flow the patients in those studies were getting 30, 40, or higher. Okay. Um, and so as you turn up the flow, you can definitely aerate the lungs more. So kind of the tidal volume uh, or lung volumes, I should say, are higher. PF ratios improve, oxygenation is better. So there's some linear effect there. The work of breathing doesn't seem to be as much of a linear effect. Um, it's certainly there's a difference, um, but it, it's not linear. So I don't know if that helps with some of the questions. But sort of this guy in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, we're trying to kind of prevent him from getting intubated. We're going to crank up the flow. 30, 40, I would crank it up as high as you can tolerate. Um, okay. And we talked about this a little bit in the intro. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to go on. But um, again, I've had patients with COPD where they're on room air and like 40 liters a minute because they need that to wash out their dead space and improve their work of breathing, but they don't need the oxygenation. So it kind of depends on why you're using it. But for this patient with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, we're going to want kind of high flow and high FiO2. Okay. All right. So we solved this guy too. 60 liters, 80%. We don't have a step down unit at my hospital. You might have one at yours that can take high flow. Okay. All right, any questions about high flow? No? Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, this third case. All right, so we've got a lady with a history of heart failure. Um, coming in with a few weeks of worsening orthopnea and dyspnea, weight gain, kind of classic heart failure symptoms. Hypoxemic, crackles. Right. What do you think's going on with this lady? Cardiogenic pulmonedema. Yep, pretty good story. Not going to belabor it. So here were some Lasix, great. What do you think would benefit this patient? Non-invasive, high flow. CPAP. CPAP. Okay, so I'm getting universal calls for CPAP. How come? 
the peep it provides actually helps right uh, uh for recruiting more alveoli yeah absolutely so the key is the peep in this case or that epap yeah um and it helps in a couple of different ways um so one yes it might kind of lead to some recruitment and decrease extravascular lung water what else is the peep going to do does it have any effect on kind of cardiac pressures and preload decrease preload it decreases both the preload and the afterload. Uh, yeah. So, so couple, I mean, afterload mm -hmm. for the uh, LV and preload for both LV and RV. Yeah, great. So it's going to decrease. Yeah, just kind of just as you said, right? Um, so it's absolutely going to decrease venous return to the right side of the heart, which sometimes is not great when you apply positive pressure ventilation, right, to your patient in forward septic shock. That can be a little dicey. Um, but in this case, where you've got way too much preload, it's helpful. Um, and then it also decreases afterload, which I think is not as intuitive, frankly, um, as the preload, but it, it does that by decreasing the transmural pressure across the left ventricle. So one of my attendings used to say that PEEP is like giving a hug to the left ventricle. I have a color, colorful way to say it. Yeah. But absolutely, and there's, there's data for using both CP and BiPAP in acute decompensated heart failure. So I think you are all right. I would definitely choose CPAP for this patient. Okay. And so here's some of the data. But um, so this is non-invasive ventilation looking at both CPAP and BiPAP, acute left heart failure. There's improved survival. All right. So this patient, I'm going to move us on for the sake of time. I say that she doesn't do so well and you put her on high flow. Um, we talked about this already. I'm going to go ahead, but the, here's the kind of the nitty gritty of the, of the data. Okay. And so this is high flow nasal cannula with the mouth, mouth closed. They're measuring maybe about two, kind of up to five, depending on what phase of the respiratory cycle, um, centimeters of water. So pretty negligible. And then with the mouth open, basically nothing. So it might help, in this case, it might help with work of breathing. Um, I actually don't know of a study like comparing high flow and, and CPAP for heart failure specifically, um, but if you really want that PEEP, it should probably needs non-invasive. Okay. All right, I think we talked about all these things. I wanna dive into one more case before we get snatched back to the, the main room. All right, so what do you see on this? Chest CT. Uh, don't talk. Oh. Sat on. Yeah, so I think a couple people mentioned it. We've got some PEs here. Saddle PE. Okay. Um, we've got a lady coming in with shortness of breath, chest pain, and a swollen leg. Okay, so we're going to kind of Hitting us over the head here. She's got a PE. She's hypoxemic. She's tachypnic. She's tachycardic. Pretty hypoxemic. So she's got a blood gas there, 7.4435, 54. And someone popped end tidal CO2 on her, and the end tidal is only reading 14. So why is that? Very shallow breathing, fast and shallow breathing. Okay, so she's certainly to cap next. So maybe she has um, kind of low tidal volumes. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you think, how come the end tidal is so much lower than the measured PCO2 on her blood gas? She's got the obstruction, so we're having, a, we got a VQ mismatch, so the end tidal that she's actually breathing out, um, that's, you know, from her tachypnea is low, that's the amount of CO2 that's actually exiting her body, but it's a question of if we can actually get enough blood flow to the areas of the lung that are still perfusing. Yeah, so I think about what both of you are getting at there is that this has to do with dead space, right? So there's always a, just a little bit of a difference between our end tidal and our um, arterial CO2, but it should be pretty negligible. Um, 
and it normally should be a pretty good surrogate. But in the case of a PE, where you have a big increase in dead space, it's absolutely right. You're actually not able to clear CO2 because you're not perfusing enough of the alveoli. Does that make sense? Um, and so when you see a discrepancy between end tidal and uh, measured arterial CO2, you should always think of dead space. Okay. And so you guys do a bedside echo. She's got a dilated RV with reduced function. You put her on BiPAP and she gets hypotensive. What do you think's going on there? I mean, the RV was already strained and we strained it further. Yeah, how did we strain it further? I totally agree with you. The, the, by increasing the afterload on RV. Yeah, exactly. So tell me more, you're on a roll. Oh. We absolutely increased the afterload. <laughs> The yes, so uh, in increased EPAP would increase the pressures on the alveoli and then uh, would uh, uh, like uh, compress the capillaries and would cause increased afterload towards the, uh, you know, uh, RV uh, and, and increase, not increase preload, but in because of the increased afterload on the RV, the less blood is pumped forward. Yeah, beautiful. So in your alveoli, you have blood vessels right, that run along the walls. And if you distend them with PEEP, you're actually gonna compress those vessels. Um, and at a certain point, you're gonna compress them enough, right, that the pulmonary vascular resistance in those, out, in those capillaries is gonna increase. So now you have a failing right ventricle and you increase pulmonary vascular resistance. So you've just asked it to do even more work. Um, so absolutely. This is a lady. So this is an example. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say this is a lady who we intubated her, she's gonna code. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is sort of the, this is the downside of positive pressure, right, in acute, in acute respiratory failure. Um, so your attending wants to give her lytics, but you guys all know better. You all know better, I should say. Um, and you take the BiPAP off, and you're going to use another modality for her. Okay, so I think we're probably about to return to the main session, but this is exactly what we talked about. I'm going to increase PVR, and that's going to make it harder for the RV to work. Yeah. And so I think this is, we've got 45 seconds before we're going back to the main session. I think this is the take home is why we're not gonna use non-invasive kind of indiscriminately for all causes of acute respiratory failure. Um, for CPAP or for heart failure and for COPD, absolutely. But for sort of all comers with respiratory, acute respiratory failure, you really wanna think carefully. Um, high flow, I think absolutely, give it a try. Um, but just be mindful of that positive pressure. All right, we're going back to the main session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. You guys are ready. <laughs>